So I'm going to be extending a warm welcome to Kevin here tonight. Hello, Carmen. Hi, how are you? Quite well here. A little out of our colder nights of the year. Okay, so you're, but you are uh, west of us, so that means it'll be hitting us soon. Yes, it tends to go that way normally. And you're in Tucson, so cold for you is... <laughs> cold for us is going down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 2 Celsius oh, in your terms. That is, yeah, that is actually fairly chilly. Well, welcome, you know, and, and to our wonderful cozy evening here on Psychic Access. And uh, I have just been thinking about uh, everything that you've been writing about, including there were lots of topics that you covered, such as... Uh, psychics uh, psychics uh, representation in the Bible and what we'll be covering today is also uh, some of the uh, misconcep misconceptions about psychics such as are we really possessed do we go to hell can we uh, divine psychic work uh, and what is psychic work in the Bible what it, how is it defined and what is its uh, scope and breadth so you wrote this wonderful book Kevin and uh, please tell us a bit about yourself. And he has a, a very wonderful book out, and he will be discussing it tonight. So um, let's have a look at your history, uh, Kevin. You have been with this church for how long? Well, with Beaver Street Baptist Church, I was with it from uh, 1999 to 2011 right now. Uh, my mm -hmm. membership is still there, but uh, this, is, this is the way I'm teaching currently. Okay, and uh, so you have quite an extensive knowledge of a version of the Bible, and you want to be specific about this because uh, for those of you that uh, know or learning a bit more about the uh, Baptist's uh, uh, way of thinking, it's, it's very much specifically, is it not, um, based on actual uh, ver verbiage in the, in the scriptures, very, very much two point, going back to its perhaps its most original sources, so as to attain or maintain the truth. So a lot of what you do is study of scriptures and its versions. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the thing is, is that we believe that the Bible is above any other doctrine in the Southern Baptist Church. And what I've done when I was teaching my classes is that we would have several versions that we would bring. And if it came to a particularly tough scripture, something that we really had to kind of dig into to get the meaning. I would have several people read from different versions, but we would ultimately like to look at the King James Version because it being a version that was commissioned 400 years ago, it stood the test of time at a time when scripture was held in much higher esteem than it has been in the 21st century. Uh, we would kind of defer to that as being a little bit on the more, more authoritative side um, when it really came down to that. And for those of us that don't know, when, when was that exactly put together and printed? Um, 402 years ago in 1611. Okay, so this would have been prior to the printing press, so this would actually have been written in manuscript form, is that correct? Uh, not actually. Um, Gutenberg and Vern invented the printing press approximately 150 years before that time. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. And there were... Mm -hmm both handwritten and uh, printed versions of the original King James versions. Interesting. Okay, so this would have been the official version that has been pretty much printed out. So that is the most original version that we know. And uh, your story uh, goes back, as you say, uh, 20 years. But do you give us a little bit of background on you, Kevin? And what brings you here to us? Well, to bring it in a nutshell... It actually goes back further, uh, 38 years ago when I was a teenager and I was dating a girl at, at our church that was a psychic. She basically was precognitive. She could tell you anything before it happened and it would come true. And uh, it was that that really got me intrigued into saying, okay, how does she do, how does she do this? And in the long course of the way, I asked a couple of youth leaders at the church I was at then, I said, uh, what do you think of somebody who just knows things before they happen? And they said, uh, that's not of God. I'd stay away from that. The other youth leader who was listening said, yeah, I would stay away from that. Well, you try telling a 17-year-old boy that uh, his girlfriend is not of God or of the devil, and uh, I wasn't buying it, especially because I knew that she herself was a Christian, 
uh, none of this was matching up that you know, you either had to be a psychic or a Christian, but you couldn't be both. Uh, my wife, in fact, today, she is a psychic and a Christian, too. So, you know, it isn't fitting with this view that, you know, it's mutually exclusive. That's right. And uh, I was reading your book, and it was quite fascinating, really, Kevin, because you were talking about different forms of psychic visions that had been described in the Bible, mostly mediumship. And then you gave a fascinating account of how mediumship works. That mediumship, if I'm correct, you were able to access certain archives, let's say, of biblical visions, have them reinforced by certain persons in this area, in, I want to say, not purgatory, but in Hades, not hell. And please explain that to us, because that's a really fascinating concept. We're just going into this very quickly here. What he described, just for you guys that don't know, is he said that basically we can access sort of a biblical archive in a sort of a holding area in the spiritual world that is pretty much a channel through to these, uh, these archives. Is that correct? Well, here's what had happened in reality. First of all, um, I don't deal with purgatory. That, that I believe, is a Catholic uh, thing that happened roughly in the Middle Ages. But biblically, this is what happened about um, three years ago. I was preparing a lesson on heaven, and I thought, well, I'll go through the entire scriptures through a word search electronic Bible. And it was much to my shock that I was finding out that there was not one single scripture that supports the fact that when we depart this life, that we're automatically in heaven if we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Conversely, if we had not received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we were automatically in hell. And what I was finding was scriptures that were alluding to the fact that in the Old Testament, the place was called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. In the New Testament, used the Greek word Hades, both referred to a place of the dead. Um, I was doing a sermon to fill in for the pastor one night on the subject of Jonah and in Jonah 2 6 it said you brought my life back up from the pit O Lord and I had said that Jonah had died and was re resurrected and he said no it cannot be well the pastor took my message looked it up and said that he was in Hades the place of the dead and he said I didn't think that that was possible but he says you were right that that was that he was in Hades and God resurrected him. Um, I believe that I had said that there was over 12 references to Hades in the New Testament and over 20, correct me if I'm wrong there, in the Old Testament referring to Sheol as a place that we uh, will go to prior to the fact of Sheol or Hades giving up the dead at the time of the judgment, that place will be thrown into the lake of fire then we are judged at that point, and those who have received Christ as their Lord and Savior will go into the kingdom of heaven. So at this point, mediums are correct in saying when they refer to the other side that that is a place that we are going prior to this judgment. Okay, so let me summarize. So it's not purgatory, because that's a Catholic term, but this area is like a, a sub-area of... This is very interesting lore and mythology for those of us that like this kind of s story as well. Is that an area where we can go and we can not be judged, but where we can discover who we are and what we want to do, where we want to be. So after we've passed, we have another chance, according to your scriptures, to be able to be redeemed or to accept uh, you know, your God and, and so forth. So that's a very interesting notion because it's very final in the Catholic religion or in any, most Christians feel that that's it. You die and that's it. You will go to hell or heaven. But you actually have this in-between phase, and this is where what I found quite touching and very interesting in your writing, and this is where the mediums will go in and access biblical wisdom. Is that correct? Well, I don't know that they access biblical wisdom in Sheol. Mm -hmm. What I do note is that mediumship is validated by the fact that it says in 
First Peter three eighteen through twenty. It says Christ was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit through whom he went and preached to the spirits in Hades. And hmm. oh, I like that. That's great. What uh, so, so the fact uh, is is that Jesus did that, and then of course you go back to your Gospels, and in John fourteen twelve he says, "He who has believed in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do greater things than these because I go to the Father." So there you go. That's your biblical evidence that mediumship is a spiritual gift. And what I liked about your book was uh, the definition of gift. And for those of us that have been in this industry, some of us have these silent eye rolls when we think of what we do. Gift or curse, often a curse, certainly marketable, but some of us have no other option but to have constant visions or insight into things that we maybe have no use for, uh, that we maybe have no understanding of, and then get persecuted for. And what you defined as a gift was very interesting in your book. You mentioned that this could be anything from spiritual wisdom, such as psychic work, all the way through to administration or craftsmanship. That the definition in the biblical teachings were that these were actually skills and that they were on par with regular everyday trade skills. So that in fact it was not seen as anything special, higher than man or higher than God or higher than anybody's vocation. It was just an everyday opportunity to work and in this case spiritually. Is that correct? Well, I disagree with you on one thing is that any of the talents or gifts and by the way there is no distinction in that in fact i I checked one of the early dictionaries that was used close to the time of the king james version and Mm -hmm. and one definition of talent and one definition of gift are very are actually synonymous but the fact is that the lord puts those into us In, in the 139th psalm he says i praise you lord for you saw my unformed body in my mother's womb i am Fearfully and wonderfully made, you knit me together. That's not addressed to Satan. That's addressed to the Lord. And if you're born with your gift, and many of, in fact, I will say at this point with my limited knowledge of how many psychics I know, all of the ones I know were born with their gift. So you can't attribute that to Satan. The likewise yeah. is that, you know, in Joel 2.28, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You know, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall see visions, and your young men shall dream dreams, even on my manservants and maidservants, and he puts it that way to illustrate Christianity, I will pour out my spirit. And so, you, again, if he's pouring it out on everybody, this refutes many times a Christian argument that says only Christians can have spiritual gifts from the negative oh. side of that. You've got in Matthew 7, 21, where they say, well, many will say to me on that day, referring to judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy and do all these things in your name? And he said, you know, I will say unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. So that illustrates that spiritual gifts are not limited to Christians, but they are given by the Lord fascinating you know and they all have they have different applications um, because uh, one of the things what I was trying to get through here is the it the gift is it defined as uh, divination or natural spontaneous visions because you're correct in that my first vision and most of the kids people that we know we had them as kids they we were probably our earliest memories are seeing spirits before we had the right or the opportunity to decide what you know, religion or beliefs we wanted to to live by. So these were very, you know, the, the very true assertion of this. Now, uh, you were saying that one of the th- reasons why we're also having such a good discussion over the last few weeks is discussing with us the distortion or the change of the words in the Bible, in the versions of the Bible. Yes. Um, one of the main there's what i used to call the five anti-medium verses of the bible this would be leviticus 19 18 leviticus 20 verse 6 leviticus 20 27 deuteronomy 18 10 and isaiah 8 19 these are the core verses that christianity uses 
And what I was referring to is that each one of those verses uses the word medium. It'll say, like, do not turn to mediums or spiritists, for you will be defiled by them, says the Lord. That's Le Leviticus 19.18. Well, the problem is that in the King James Version, 402 years ago, the original wording was, do not turn to them that have familiar spirits. Well, originally, I always thought that that was written that way because maybe the word medium hadn't been coined in the English language yet. But when I went to look it up, it said a spirit that attends at a call, which is, huh? as you've known enough mediums to know, it does not work that way. Uh, when you go to look at the time that Saul, King Saul of Israel, went to a person with a familiar spirit in 1 Samuel 28, the woman asked, what spirit do you want me to call up for you? That is not like any medium that I have known. Exactly. So, you know, very, that is a practice. Very, very good point. Yes. Uh, so what's happening there is it's if, if, you, if that person didn't call the spirit, the spirit wouldn't initiate the contact. That is the kind of work that the Lord is forbidding, you know, and uh, forbidding people to turn to is the person that has a spirit that they call upon. But as you know yourself, you, you talk about seeing the visions. You talk about, you know, seeing spirits that come to you that you do not have control over that is something that you probably have remembered since you know your earliest memories and those are not condemned in scripture yeah and then this is where we went into an even more delicate discussion in your book about it being okay okay there was two points that i thought were fascinating for one that even let's say you are christian and you want and you have to have natural gifts like this is what i found was an interesting point that you you brought in it's like please don't try and become psychic i mean if you have an interest in it sure and if it's for a christian reason that's nice but your 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 book didn't necessarily encourage every layman going out and picking up a group of a bunch of tarot cards and teaching themselves to read. It was specifically to do with natural visionaries. Well, let's put it this way. Which I agree with, by the way. I, I think that's I'm a very sorry, interesting talk notion. Over you? Yeah. Um, in First Corinthians twelve eleven, it says that all of the gifts are given by the Spirit, and He gives them as He determines. And the way I put it in that. 14th chapter of the book which you read there was that you know if you sought to develop a gift that the spirit decided was not right for you you would become second rate at it yeah, and that's so you would cool. be disobeying the <laughs> lord of course first but you'd be second rate at it because the spirit feels you're much better in a different gift for example myself the lord gave me the gift of teaching which you'll find in all three lists of spiritual gifts expressly stated in the New Testament. Um, the Lord decided I don't need to be a psychic because I have a wife who is. And yeah. so he gave me this gift. Uh, Melanie, who you read about in the book, you know, she said to her, said to me last week, she said, you know, mediums are a dime a dozen, Kevin, but she says, you are a gifted teacher of the word. And yeah. she says, I don't find many of those. Yeah, that's correct. And that's actually quite redemptive for us in the psychic industry because we get a lot of spammers and imitators and people that, uh, you know, unfortunately that take down the level of our work. There are a lot of very, uh, even even new newbies and whatever, they, they are, they're pretty good, but there's a huge imitation, a group of imitators that, you know, profess to be healers, that profess to be spiritual, that teach themselves psychic work. And you're right, they may not be very good at it. And that's something I struggle with because I try to teach people empathy and I try to understand like you know f for you know the greater good why people are maybe good at what they do but maybe not as compassionate or maybe why they're not good at divination at all as, as which I can see with certain people and that narrows it down to specific people being able to uh, divine or bring across messages and this includes usually beneficial messages 
would you say that there's any specific tone that a medium uh, that you feel should adopt if they are connected to the correct source? Well, I would probably not say that because I'm not a medium myself and the only thing I garner is what Melanie has told me in there. But I would say that, you know, you give what you're given. You know, in fact, uh, John the Baptist said this in John chapter 3. He said, a man can only give what is given him from heaven. Now, as Melanie has told me that when she sees something, she just gives it. It could be an oddball item. Like uh, she told the story with us on our last talk show together that um, she did a reading when she was a teenager and there was a red umbrella. Well, she thought that was silly, and she didn't mention it in the reading, but this person felt that something was missing and said, are you sure you told me everything? And she said, well, okay, there's this thing about a red umbrella. And she said, my grandmother carried a red umbrella. That was her. So the fact is, is that if you give everything straight, um, she was telling me an instance with a lawyer that she was seeing and she says this this guy standing right by you and he says his name is Raymond and she and the lawyer said that's my dad they said everybody called him buddy and she said very few people knew that his name was Raymond and it was a strong confirmation to her that the lawyer's father was right there in the room so that's like an like what I would see that is that's almost like a verification process. When people uh, are able to pick up correct cues, then one would assume that they can go through to a higher source quite easily. Um, yet, uh, you know, some of the things I wanted to talk about was, you know, there's there's also a sense of what people get into when they do spiritual work, and no offense to anybody who does, but there's a certain amount of mania, rapture. Uh, and a sense of heightened excitement um, to the to the point where these things can encourage many many forms of many movements and wars and and uh, revolutions and such due to the heightened excitement and then that would bring us to people that perhaps state they have visions and that may not be the correct visions now I'm sure that you get people in your church who have correct uh, well-meaning visions but they may not necessarily be true would they be considered false prophets as well let's say they're seeing the kingdom of heaven they're seeing Jesus and whatnot and are they considered false prophets because you had a very interesting statement in your book which I thought was very nice if you could quote me on that because I, I you were actually quoting words um, of what Jesus said he was saying beware of false prophets because the Pharisees will take and I'm pleased that's not verbatim they will they will put on a show they will basically take you for your money and they will play it up as if this is the correct they will put more force on you they will make you work harder and there was something like that can you quote me on that i will actually try and look that up here i have your book well okay the the original biblical source was mm -hmm. talking about um hypocrisy and the fact of people seeking a reward this is in chapter 10 if you're actually thumbing through the book right now where okay. i talk about you know what about my gift and talking about being compensated for using a spiritual gift and in the end, I said, you know, watch out that, you know, prominence or popularity is warned about because Jesus was there saying in Matthew chapter 6, you know, don't be like the Pharisees and those who stand on the street corner and pray long prayers just so someone can think how holy they are. He says, truly, I say to you, they have their reward. And he's saying, you know, don't put on a big show of piety. Um, more than anything that he is saying right there. And so, you know, I, I devoted two chapters in there, both chapters 9 and 10, about working for the Lord, being dedicated to working for him, what you can expect, uh, what you have a right to have, what you may choose to defer until you're in the kingdom of heaven. And that's really where that all comes in. 
That's phenomenal. I mean, so, you know, what I see from this is that, uh, and I understand this, um, I don't know if you study the apocrypha, apocrypha, <laughs> um, but that there's a little hint in there about Jesus perhaps being testy, frustrated, and vexed, to say, put it nicely, with imitators and people that were trying to abuse or usurp his teachings and his sufferings. And uh, I will look for that now. It was such a heartfelt implore. He was imploring people not to listen uh, to these these people. And so it's, again, beware of imitation. And you could take this into the further biblical context as well and saying that people may have an understanding of the Bible, but they may not have an understanding of the message. And uh, they... We were talking, and you were saying that, you know, you study everything very, very literally. Now, I remember there was a, I was looking up, we were discussing it the other night, uh, Corinthians, I think, uh, you know what, I'm new at this, so uh, please help me, but spiritual gifts. Uh, yeah. There was a statement in Corinthians that talks about spiritual gifts, right? And I'm going to try and look there that is. up right It, it now. first talks about, it gives a list of the spiritual gifts, then it yeah. talks about the fact that it compares the spiritual gifts to the parts of a human body. This is all 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if people have a Bible there. I also discuss this in chapter 7 of my own book. It first says that, first of all, you cannot say that there's more important parts and less important parts, that you can't say that there are needless gifts, but that sometimes one gift protects another one is more prominent while the hidden ones are more important to a certain function and then he gives a slight ranking at the very end you know that he is called first apostles second prophets third evangelists and teachers and goes on down until he you know reaches the gift of tongues That's yeah can we list, re read that list out for can i read that out for our um our readers our listeners just the first yeah. few uh, um, we have. Are you talking about the list I have in the seventh chapter? Yes, yeah. here are the message yeah, of wisdom, message of knowledge, faith, healing, you have miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits. So, for those of us that like to talk about difference between ghosts and spirits, speaking in different types of tongues, interpretations of tongues, which many of us don't have experience in, uh, apostleship pastoring, teaching, ability to help others. 14, we have administration, so that would be the administration of, I guess, the organization. Encouraging, contributing to the needs of others, leadership, mercy, and then evangelism. Now, those are the lifts, the, the, the gifts that were uh, listed in, in depth here that you have done this list. Uh, and then you have, furthermore, you have in the Old Testament, artistic craftsmanship, justice, strength, revealing of mysteries, interpretation of dreams, music, speech, and rest, guidance, and boldness. Now, these are beautiful lists. Um, and then also, I love number 31, which is Ecclesiastes 519, which is the ability to enjoy your work. Of all things that we've never thought about because, you know, we're taught to be so pious and to basically ignore uh, some of our own uh, our own needs uh, due to the teachings. And you know what? I'm going to put you on a break for one moment. We're going to go to a commercial for one minute, Kevin. We're going to just come back to that point and reconnect with you. Okay? That would be great. Great. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com you can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We are living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com. 
Okay, welcome back. We are going back to our conversation with Kevin. So, Kevin, you know, um, we were talking about, you know, syntax, or at least the way things were written in the Bible as well, because, you know, they, they, they gloss over, uh, and you've summarized so very nicely what gifts are, and they certainly aren't um, all, they're all pretty amazing in terms of music and such. And then what I want to say is for an example with uh, what we have in the Bible is written as uh, could be misinterpreted is uh, two versions. It says here now in uh, Corinthians uh, cha uh, 1, chapter 12, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you know you were Gentiles carried away by those dumb idols, however you were led. Yet I have seen a version of it that would say these mute idols and I can completely understand how these things would be misinterpreted you know by the average person they would look at that and they'd go stupid idols but they don't actually understand that maybe it is about mute idols people that are looking at effig effigies which in essence you know many religions don't really encourage uh, representation uh, what I'm really speaking of is that an idol cannot speak, it can't see, it can't hear, you know, it's simply an object of metal or wood. So then they would not be just dumb, they would also be blind. And so that is, for example, a good example of a not a very good interpretation of scripture, because what you're trying to say is, no, they're, they're blind and mute, and... Uh, they can't speak. They can't speak for us. So uh, this is the kind of twists and turns that one sees in biblical writing that, you know, you're trying to work through, which are very specific terms that can have broad misinterpretations for all of religion, huge groups of people, and the inclusion of more people into your way of thinking. This is, again, why, you know, as I said at the beginning of the show, that when we came to passages that were on the touchy side we would look at several versions in the class have people read them we would give a little bit more credence to the king james version for what it was um one one of the toughest lessons that i had to teach over the 21 years was having the topic of jesus turning the water into wine at king of galilee this is one where nobody seems to leave the bible as it is stated but wants to add things to it, and the whole reasoning is is their minds have trouble accepting the fact that Jesus would create an alcoholic beverage. We don't. <laughs> we're not told why. Oh dear, but shouldn't that be a gift? <laughs> well, I, I tend to think of it this way: Jesus didn't have gifts; he was the giver. Mm -hmm. And you know using the Holy Spirit to, to give gifts and that Jesus himself gave gifts is many times interchanged in the Bible and used to mean the same. Um, yeah, so the giver and then the gift itself. Right, and so that's why he again said, he who believes in me will do what I have been doing. Now, of course, I haven't ran across people that are turning water into wine, but the whole idea there was that too many people had to interject something so that it would comfort their traditional ways of thinking that, oh, you know, it's a sin to drink alcohol. No, it's a sin to get drunk. You know, same thing that you probably read in the book. It's not a sin to gamble. It is a sin to be greedy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so that's th correct. That's nice. So then that wouldn't compound guilt, and you wouldn't have to feel, you know, which, of course, is for many people a self-perpetuation of addiction, for example. I mean, that would be more supportive as to say, you know, that it's necessarily bad. I mean, that you can enjoy that gift in the moment. So, yeah, and again, it's, it's, we, you know, a person would have to exercise wisdom. But this is why, again, when the verse says in Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is giving you that wisdom to say, here's the point where you can handle it you know beyond my human limited ways of seeing it the holy spirit would say here is the point that's enough here is what you need to do next okay so don't gift and drive 
<laughs> yeah, I guess, is that a good one for the holiday season? <laughs> yes. Well, now this brings us to exactly the top of the year, which is sort of for us that, you know, now now that we're all warmed up to you and know that, you know, we're not, you know, I, I do know this from growing up that I was always damned, you know, I still probably am to some extent. And uh, in the eyes of, of many different types of believers, even for charging. And you mentioned that, you know, charging is okay if you feel you want to charge, like you were talking about uh, one of the apostles uh, that did not. He just got uh, exchanges. Is that Was that John or Tho- Thomas? I can't remember. That was remember. the apostle Paul, Paul and okay. he gave the reasons why. Was that At that time, there was people out there who were calling themselves, as he called it, the super apostles in the second Corinthians, and he wanted to set himself apart from that. He also wanted the people of Corinth to see that he had no ulterior motives. You know, most of us, you know, you hear some new great thing and you're thinking, okay, what's it going to cost me? He wanted to absolve himself of that. And the third thing was he wanted to set an example that he would work harder than the rest of them and and set that example that, you know, if you're going to work for the Lord, expect to work. It's not a gravy train. So Paul did that by his choosing. And I made that a a clear illustration in chapter 10 that when he accepted no money for his work as an apostle that that was his choosing and that scripture bears out that you know he will have a reward in heaven for what he's not taken here in that way yeah now that's true and we wanted to discuss heaven a little because we already touched on Hades and not and thank goodness some of us you know we have a chance to learn from life's mistakes and then uh, pretty much wake into consciousness uh, if we can't get it or grasp it in this life but you would think you'd want to enjoy this life um, you know in a spirit in a good way and uh, you know Maureen uh, she wants to ask a question so I'm just going to bring her in here is this a short? I, I just want to make a comment before you got. You, you were talking about the gift and the giver, and it's. Uh, by the way, I'm really enjoying the interview. By the way, um, you know, I was wondering. I always tell my daughter, never love the gift more than the giver. And when you were talking about mm-hmm. that, I really felt that applied. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Uh, never. So love now the gift that would be giver. again the message and not the psychic. But surely well, so, you can like the certain psychic that comes in. Well, no, I, he was talking, you know, you were talking about, you know, he he turned, uh, well, you know, like water. He did these things, and it wasn't like that. It was He was a giver. Jesus. I know, I know. So it wasn't really a miracle. It was just the fact that he felt like doing good stuff. Yeah, so we should never love the, love the gift more than the giver itself. Oh, I see. In terms of, like, yeah, yeah don't get yeah. addicted to the... To the wine. Well, yeah, and, and I, is that is that really what you were saying? Well, one of the things about the story in John chapter two of the water being turned into wine is that it's about obedience. You know, he simply had his 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 mother Mary had said, you know, they have no more wine, and then she turns to the servant and says, "Do whatever he tells you to do." Well, he points to six stone jars and says, fill it to the brim with water. And then he says, I want you to take some of it out and bring it to the master of the feast. You know, and to this point, these people have not seen him do a miracle previously because it's stated at the end of this that this was the first. So they're probably thinking, this is silly. I'm supposed to draw some water out and take it to the master? He's going to think I've lost my mind. But they obey to the letter, and the master of the feast says, usually they serve the good wine first and keep the cheaper stuff for later, but you have kept the best wine until now. Hmm. <laughs> That's funny. So you could probably store up some of the uh, the good stuff, essentially. And um, I hope that answered your question, Maureen. No, you know, I, was I, want- just, I was making a comment. It wasn't okay. it was really something I thought was really beautiful when my daughter was growing up. Yeah, never love the gift more than the giver. Mm-hmm. And he so- was a giver, you know. 
But you know, there were sides to. Uh, Kevin, had you done any studies on the apocrypha in your Actually, in your work? Actually, no. Um, I've I've stuck strictly to the sixty six canonical books, and you know, as you were relating what you had learned in the apocrypha. It had a slight out of character sound to me compared to the Gospels because mm -hmm. Jesus never, I guess from what I was hearing was it sounded like he was trying to steer people away from others and towards himself where he simply was saying, you know, in Matthew chapter 7 to beware of false prophets. He would say, you know, you will know them by their fruits. He simply laid out the course because Right. You know, that is some something we can take down that I do have from, to determine, you know, right. and, and to say, okay, you'll know them by their fruits. You know, you'll know whether they exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, so forth. Yeah, uh, sure. And, and I was just reading into that, and I thought there was actually a very good chapter, and I'll try and find that for you, but where he actually where you described very well how he implores people to, and the suffering that he went through. And of course, this is Jesus. I mean, I just don't think that the man would have just taken this, you know, lying down. I mean, he didn't. He was, you know, hung up on a cross. He didn't take it lying down. And, you know, he said, you have to turn the other cheek. But I bet you he had to learn to get to that point. And in the... I, the they, the, the Apocrypha, they don't even know necessarily if they are linked to the Bible, but what that was is a theory of, and just for some of us that want to relate a little bit better beyond the subtext of the Bible, that perhaps there was a man in there that was angry and then evolved into a man that was very, by age 33, had learned from a lot of his ways. Uh, so... There are different versions of that, and I think that's what I was reading into because, you know, we really in our industry do have a lot of spammers, and a lot of us complain about that, and a lot of us try and give exemplary work, and then unfortunately, you know, whatever we define as good and well studied, as you know, you will find on on certain sites like ours. Uh, but on the other hand, there are a lot of people like imitators and. I wanted to ask you, um, that, so that is my concern, but you have people, and I'm not saying I'm the best, but I am aware of how many people copy my work, for example, and that's where I'm going on. And then what I wanted to ask you was, so if a Christian person has a vision, is it necessarily, like you said, it could be the umbrella and it's a verifying uh, vision, but do you think it could also be like necessarily not of Christ? Well, that's very. Tr that could be very true. This is where, let's say, if I were a medium, I would say the Bible command in First John four one to three says, "Brothers, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Every spirit that confesses that Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and the one who does not confess that is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in the world, as it says. Now, for somebody like myself who is not a medium." This is where it says, you shall know them by their fruits. Are they following Christ? Do you see evidence in their life of the Spirit of the mm -hmm. Lord at work mm -hmm. in them where they are showing the what we call the fruits? Love, joy, patience, long-suffering, um, uh, gentleness, kindness that you read in Galatians 5.23. Are that is that being exemplified in their life? And, of course, then... Well, as I said in chapter 10 of the book, is kind of the track record. You know, has what this person said come to pass? How accurate has it been? Um, how many times have they done such a thing? You know, and I treated it in that chapter very much like a bank loan application. But if you were to go first off, I would say look at the characteristics, the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. You know, and that should tell you a lot right there whether this person is somebody to give consideration to. Okay, that's cool. So in other words, though, well, we have to be judges, master judges of behavior in a sense, and what we would see as good in one person may not be necessarily if we perceive certain the values. Like in our society, surely most people that are perceived as good, they have success 
whether the success is to be published, whether the success is to be rich, uh, that is a measure of good. Yet for many people, and, and there are so many people that don't have that measure of success, that they are seen as void. And so at that would, I could see, could be a problem in the 21st century, right? For sure. This is why, Carmen, that I wrote the one chapter in the book about, you know, where I said working for the Lord paying benefits and saying that, you know, the amount of success that we have or that we have the ability to do it full time is not the way that the Lord measures success. Um, and I, of course, illustrated their point of, you know, going through a cemetery at the end and seeing that nobody is not acknowledged for their business success, but for whether they, for example, were a loving father or grandfather. And of course, when we come to stand before the Lord someday, it's going to be, did you obey my word? It's not going to be how much of it I did, how many people I reached, because that's the Spirit's job. The Spirit is going to reach the people. It's, am hmm. I obeying Christ? And that's going to be the question asked of me. Did you receive him as your Lord and Savior? Did you follow him as Lord? And for those of us that maybe cannot identify with the church, we want to be very clear for those of you that maybe have trouble with uh, some of the history in the church, uh, you know, with abuse and... Uh, and the abuses of the wealth in the system, that you don't have to join a congregation, though that helps, correct? Well, there's only two commands that take a semblance of church, and of course the church is run with these. It's Hebrews 10, 25, where it says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's common believers. And 1 mm -hmm. John 1, 7, which says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood cleanses us from unrighteousness. Neither of those refer to necessarily a church building, an organized creed, an organized, because, you know, I oftentimes, as I've said even in the book, is that church could be anywhere in the world today as long as we have internet connections as the kind we're using right now. Mm -hmm. We can be fellowshipping together, but our purpose is jointly honoring the Lord himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just up to some people to find the right pages and to feel accepted by the right organizations. And, and you know, I have to tell you, you know, if, if all Baptists are like you, and I've done some searches, and they're not, I mean, I felt like I was going through hellfire already just doing some of the searches online uh, for videos. You know, it would be so much easier to, uh, to listen and, and to join uh, a faith like this. Now, you know, there are so many concerns for a person already in metaphysics as to what does it bring to their work. Will it bring an extra dimension? Will it close them down and so forth? But this feels very, very open to me. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you were discussing about uh, one of the things that says, never override the words of the Bible. What would be an override if you had a vision? Well, this is... This was, for example, where I talked about the story of Jesus turning the water into wine. Some people would say, well, that actually meant grape juice, or it, he was trying to fit to go along with a custom of the Jews at the time or something. Don't add additional teachings. Mm -hmm. This is, again, mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. you know, and on a different show, I had given six reasons why the church wants to keep perpetuating the idea that, for example, that if you're not one of them or you don't keep one particular ordinance of the church, that your gift must not be of God. I actually went in, into a list of nine reasons like that, and I said not one of them holds up. And I, I illustrated why. I know that you're short on time, so I can't go into it mm -hmm. that much mm -hmm. now. No, but it's a great point because, in other words, we can fill in with some of our visions, but as long as we don't go, oh, and we think that uh, we will add to the book of Revelations this and this edition, and that's my vision, and that will be gospel, that's not necessarily acceptable. So what they're saying is you can fill in some of the visions and some of the prophecies, but you won't necessarily be taken as gospel. I think that's, that's fair, and that's actually you know, how one would perceive art, too. And music. Well, it would be up to the individual to some extent with that. Well, I did write a chapter in the book, chapter 13, where I said, Departure of the Disciples, Why No New Scripture? And mm -hmm. one of the lines in the sand that they draw is that the people who wrote the New Testament were 
either those who had walked and talked with Jesus while he was on the earth or that they were closely affiliated with someone like that. Um, so that, you know, once that generation of people had all passed away, you know, by the end of the first century, that standard could no longer be met. So that made the 66 book canonical Bible, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, the standard by which we can compare any message to nowadays for validity and that it would come from the Lord so that we have such a standard. It's like a basic mathematical framework, and you should really stick to the basic formula, essentially, and the belief within the majesty or the, the beauty in that formula. And it's comforting, you know, when things are set. And I think that if you can draw on the, the parables, old stories, and, and uh, you know, mores as such, uh, that it is a comfort that you can reach back that far. And I really hope that in 5,000 years that we still have these stories. And, you know, it was a real pleasure meeting you. So much so. I really appreciate meeting you. And for those of you that really want a very nice read, uh, please do go to this website. And I'm just looking it up right now. It's at the BibleForPsychics.com. And the book is called The Bible, the Truth, the Truth About Psychics and Spiritual Gifts. So that's by Kevin Scopel. And, you know, you will please follow our links. Come on the site have a look through some of the material. He's even got excerpts there. It was a real pleasure and a real joy having you on our site and on our show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carmen. And I want to thank Doug, Maureen, Steve, and Stephen as well. You've been so great. I really enjoyed this. Such an opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. We will definitely be wanting to look more at your work. Have a great night. But Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six-minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers. Get access. Psychic Access, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. PsychicAccess.com.